at you from the 37th parallel on America's haunted highway, it's Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to episode 155. And we've got a great show planned for you. But first, we have an announcement. We got another five-star rating on iTunes. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, and this time, uh, we're kind of flattered because this came from another fellow paranormal podcast. Oh, yeah? Creep It Real podcast. Creep It Real? What a they, great name. Yeah, Creep It Real. Oh, yeah. If you're looking for something of the same flavor, in the same vein, uh, please give them a listen. Creep It Real They said, started on episode number 33, Missing People. As huge fans of Missing 411, this was a great episode, filled with awesome information. These guys do a great job of presenting it in a way that is informative, but also lighthearted and entertaining. Definitely a weekly must-listen. So, Creep It Real, thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. And again, uh, we'd like to urge our listeners, check them out, please. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for the the props. It's funny they they were so yeah. they're so early into our catalog. I know. <laughs> a lot has changed. That's back when Rob was yeah. still on the show. Yeah. Wait till you get the episode at least 80 guys. It gets better. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Preston it's it's Thanks. exciting to see that um there's other podcasts out there that like our sense of humor and our style mm-hmm, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like when I tell people about the podcast, oh, yeah. I usually say well, we 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 do what I call dick and fart jokes. That type of that type of humor. That's not what we talk about all the time. But we yeah, have like a, I mean, I describe it as just three idiots burping yeah, in the microphone for an like, hour and a half. You know, so we I do mean, really we're weird comedy. <laughs> I'm glad that you and I see things yeah. the same. <laughs> so it's sometimes it's refreshing to see that oh, there's other people that outside of our group yeah. that have that type of sense of humor too. So oh, for sure. Type. Yeah, I dig it. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate that. Well, I want to, uh, I'm going to drop a controversy on you guys real quick because I'm going to have to give us an update after I send my email. But uh, there's a new app that just got dropped, and a buddy of mine turned me on to it. And imagine like Pokemon Go, but instead of subbing in your Pokemon into the, uh, you know, the UI, you're going to take your camera out move it around, and then you're going to see that the app actually injects or inserts random Bigfoots into your photos. What? So it's kind of like a Finding Bigfoot app. Hmm. And he's like, hey, this seems right up your alley. You should check it out. And I was just getting ready to download it. And I'm not going to say the name of the app yet because I want to see what they say back. And if it's real dickish, then I'm going to put them on blast. <laughs> but basically, like, we know a thing or two about a thing or two around here on Pixelated Paranormal. Preston, what is the Rougarou? It's the uh, werewolf from uh, Louisiana. Thank you. Right? Perfect. They have a category system here of different Bigfoots, and they have different regions. And they call this one the Rougarou biome. Oh, God. The Rougarou. (laughs) The white Bigfoot. Occupy the Minnesota area up into Canada. They are the biggest known hominids in North America, averaging well over eight feet tall. Now, I've never heard of a Bigfoot be referred to as the Rougarou. I've heard of it being, you know, a, a big a wolf Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and they're from Louisiana, wolf. not fucking Canada. Right. Right, exactly. Steve, I'll throw you an easy one because you're not quite the big Bigfoot nerd like we are. We are. <laughs> we are. Uh, Jersey Devil. Bigfoot or no? No. Right. The Jersey Devil was that thing that looked like it was a cross between a horse and a kangaroo and a dragon. But at the same time, like, are they, the description on this is, says, does it say Bigfoot in the title? Well, yeah. I guess you're not wanting to give out the app yet. Okay. Yeah. The app basically is to only find Bigfoot. I thought it was going to be different cryptids. Oh, okay. So they've got an area located called the Jersey Devil biome. The Jersey Devil of which the NHL team got its name, is extremely elusive. It has very large black eyes and can most likely see in complete darkness. So basically it sounds like they're just taking like random cryptids and just assigning it to like different, 
you know, areas. So like, it's nothing but Bigfoot, but it's like, oh, the Loch Ness, if that's the Scottish <laughs> biome. <laughs> I mean, I looked for it. Let's be honest. I did look for it because that's what I was expecting. And finally, the Wendigo biome. The Wendigo, named by the Algonquin tribes, inhabits a large biome ranging from the Great Lakes all the way into Massachusetts. They are large and can be aggressive when their habitat is infringed upon. Well, no, we all know what the Wendigo was. It's yeah. not a Bigfoot. Although I will say, in the 1994 Fleer Ultra X Men trading card, <laughs> the Wendigo, do- <laughs> <laughs> the Wendigo does look like a little bit of a Bigfoot creature. And his description here is: No one knows the name of the man cursed by the terrible power of the Wendigo, the mystical monster whose cravings can only be sated by the flesh of the living. He looks a little bit like a Bigfoot, but again, I mean, if you Wikipedia any of these things, you'd see they're not Bigfoots. And even in like uh, Native American folklore, like the Wendigo sometimes is um, presented as almost like a devil-like creature. So it reminds mm-hmm. me of something off of, uh, what was that book, um, you know, where the kid opens up his closet and uh, goes on the island and has all the little different monsters. Where the wild things oh, okay. are. I was like, what? Oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like Narnia? Yeah, Narnia, the Nim Island thing, or Indian in the yeah. Cupboard. No, uh, in so the cupboard. <laughs> but if you look at like some of the monsters off where the wild things are, like those look like early depictions of the Wendigo. And yeah, sort of. But again, that's not a Bigfoot. Yeah. So I found the app to be highly. Let me push my glasses up. Actually, um, Actually. I found your app to be very problematic. Oh my god. So I'm going to shoot him an email and just say, hey, like, I'm not trying to start any ill will uh, or anything like that. But I want to point out, you know, I do really enjoy a lot of folklore and, you know, researching paranormal subjects. And you guys have this all wrong. Fuck, I'll email him right now and be like, listen, you guys, this app is shit. Fix it. Right. I mean, it seems cool. It's pretty novel where, like, you can just. (laughs) Preston's like, I'll do the more brass. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it looks like a cool app. You basically just pull up your camera and it'll just randomly insert, you know, a little CGI Bigfoot into your picture and you snap a picture. Then you can catalog, you know, where you saw it, what part of the U.S. you were in. Well, I mean, it, is, it sounds cool. Oh, great. More uh, fake flips. fucking photos of par- paranormal shit <laughs> to clog <laughs> the pipeline. That's what I should say. First off, you were promoting nothing more than more fake news. <laughs> Well, boys, in other news, on July 28th, 2020, around 7.20 p.m., residents in the Dongcheng part of China were taken aback by a bizarre phenomenon as pellets looking like snowflakes suddenly fell amid the summer season. The event lasted for almost six minutes. A resident named Mr. Li took a video of the unexplained weather and posted it on social media, causing a stir among his friends and followers. According to the Chinese media outlet The Paper, meteorologists believe it could be a chawl or a grupal, frozen white participation, <laughs> participation, <laughs> precipitation resembling hail. The Chinese Communist Party's official media, quoting experts, said it was indeed a soft hail-type phenomenon, which tends to appear in strong convection seasons of the summer. Grouples are white and opaque, cooled water droplets that are often soft and easy to crush. But, yeah, it rarely ever snows in China in the summer, so that had to have been kind of an interesting thing to uh, see. White snuff's coming out of dong. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yeah, there's those dick and fart jokes. (laughs) But yeah. while seeing it snow in the middle of the summer in China might be one thing that, that might make you say, huh. In Fort Collins, Colorado, a Colorado woman's childhood fear became reality when she leaned over her malfunctioning toilet and watched as a large corn snake slithered up and into the bowl last Wednesday. She said, I used the restroom and like went to flush and everything and it wasn't going down. I looked and leaned in closer, and a snake head slithered up. I was terrified. Hell no. Uh, It's actually been one of my fears since I was a kid. 
Stewart screened for her boyfriend and called for the maintenance man of the Varsity Apartments in Fort Collins. When Wesley Sanford (laughs) responded, he found the snake coiled up in the back, forcing him to take the entire toilet apart. It took nearly 40 minutes to set free the snake, which was almost four feet long. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. It's like they surely dropped an anaconda in that bowl. Nicknamed the (laughs) Ghoulie. Oh, no (laughs) shit, right? Uh, so they said they're thinking it's possibly a pet from another one of the tenants who actually maybe have flushed it down or it could have slithered in there on its own. Who flushes a fucking snake? I know. No kidding. The maintenance man took him home and he and his wife have named him Boots and he's now the little guard snake of their property. I feel like it's a missed opportunity and they should have named him Poopsie. Yeah, or shithead. <laughs> Poopsie. Or Brownie. Oh, Well, Preston, you wrote a very special episode for us tonight, and it's a little different. It almost reminds me of maybe like a uh, old-timey radio show. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you brought us today? All right. So this story is one we've tackled in the past, and I feel like I didn't do it uh, any justice. So Mm -hmm. if you travel back in time to episode 23 titled Jason the Mason... Do you still have that uh, cheesy intro? Oh, I got it. You better believe it. Uh, Cue it up. Cue it up, baby. Introducing for the first time on this show, a man who needs no introduction but's gonna get one anyways. The purveyor of the esoteric. An eccentric man of mystery. Maybe a mason. Maybe a guy we just found on the street. It's time for... Jason the Mason. Yep, based on that ditty, you see why that story didn't make gold platinum status. That was Jason's first go-round of podcasting, and he was a little shaky that night. You could hear the nervousness in his voice. There was a lot of uhs and ums, and just, he just, I don't know, he just doesn't do A real well. amateur, you might say. Amateur. Yeah, but we did pop his podcast cherry, so there's that. And since then, <laughs> yeah. We've perfected our craft, so to speak, and I thought we could redo this tale and give it the old pixelated paranormal justice it deserves. And Mm -hmm. to be fair, since it was episode 23, that was back in the day when I just Google searched the topic at hand and pulled the information from the worst first website that popped up. You can can go back. The worst website. Yeah. And (laughs) I've grown since then. So this time around, I've ordered the actual... (laughs) <laughs> I've ordered the actual book, The Vertical Plane, by author Ken Webster. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a drink, and strap in for The Vertical Plane, a tale of the Doddleston messages. This story takes place in Doddleston, four miles southwest of Chester on the west side of the D. Whatever the hell that Wait, is. Wait, hold, hold on. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Four miles southwest of Chester. First off, nobody should ever be named Chester. On the west uh-huh. side of the D. It's all bad. <laughs> oh, you know you know the place, Preston, on the corner of Chester and Pedo. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh. Well, Preston, you'll take Kennington Road from Chester, leave behind the suburbs of Westminster Park and Lachey, you'll turn left through the dark ribbon of Britain Woods, and prepare yourself. For the tale of the vertical plane. This story starts off in the autumn of 1984, the year that I was born, with author Ken Webster coming across a longtime friend, Nicola Bagley, outside of the funeral directors on Dolomar Street in Chester. Now, he describes Nick as being broke, having come back from a three month, uh, what do they say? They don't say vacation, they say holiday. Holiday. In East Africa. She had been living in hotels and trains, which had an insect infestation and bugs by the squadron. The better hotel, she said, had canisters of spray called Doom, which, instead of killing the roaches, served only to stimulate them. So everybody think Joe's apartment. (laughs) As Nick related her experiences, it became clear that she had not escaped from her recent past, teaching, 
unsatisfactory relationships, so bad boys, losers, and one-pump chumps. <laughs> Ken thought life at the cottage was marginally a better proposition for her and offered her a piece or a place to stay in exchange for some help with the remodeling and redecorating he needed help with. I was emerging from a long, terrible six months, which had seen all the downstairs of the house mm-hmm. gutted and then restored. There had been months of living in one room with only a kettle and dust for comfort. Well, that and teaching. I was shattered and worn out. If it weren't for a holiday in Austria with the school during the last half of the term, I would have crumbled. Debbie, my girlfriend, stayed with me through the building and remodeling, but our relationship suffered. It felt as if cement dust was eroding it. Now the work was all finished on the ground floor, but it made the upstairs look shabby. Ugh, another season of building and remodeling was about to begin. Now at this point, Nick discovers some strange marks on the wall between the bathroom and the kitchen. Has someone been putting their feet on here? They do look a bit footprinty, don't they? You've got to be in the right place to see them, but they look like they may have been there for ages. But whose feet are they? No one had owned up to the prints. They were too small for me or Deb. But Deb swears she could almost see six toes on the footprints. So at this point, they were amusing how it was done, why there were six toes, and why they looked like someone was walking up the wall. They were a size five. I don't know. Maybe they had like a ruler or maybe, you know, somebody had small feet and they were able to measure them out. Anyways, <laughs> small and dainty. Quite obviously, somebody was fooling around. Yet by late autumn, they were very faint in appearance. The morning after the footprints had been painted over, I had been downstairs to the bathroom and passed through the kitchen, perhaps twice, before I had looked closely at the wall. It stopped me mid-stride. When I did decide to look, the footprints had returned. They were not exactly in their former position, so it was not possible they were the old ones that had come through. They were new, with six toes, and composed once more out of the dust from the floor. I called the girls, Nick and Deb, and they came down, but they were more puzzled than I— and Nick was quite horrified. (laughs) She had painted them out just the day before, and I thought she was just about ready to pack her belongings and leave. So the footprints are a mystery. None of them had stirred that night. Their best guess was one of them was a sleepwalker, but why the six toes? They painted over the footprints a second time, and they never reappeared again. And everyone in the house decided not to move around at night in fear of meeting of what left them. Two days later, they make a day trip to the market. They stock up on cat food, canned goods, breads, and other essentials. They get home late, and, you know, fuck it, we're tired, and they left the snacks and groceries to be dealt with the next day. Ken was the first one up the next morning, and to his amazement, the cans of cat food had been stacked in a pyramid shape, neatly on the kitchen table. He didn't remember hearing anyone move around, and the girls were equally bewildered. What in the actual fuck is going on here? They tried to rational tried to rationalize it. Was it one of Nick's boys' toys? This scuzzy guitar player John seemed the most likely culprit because ghosts, poltergeist, demons, or anything supernatural just can't be it. Two mornings later, they wake to find a single column approximately four feet high composed of a couple of two-liter bottles, a packet of dry cat food, and a kitchen roll. It was a precarious construction, so it looked a little too good for Scuzzy John. One night, Nick thought she saw a dense shadow past her window above the kitchen. Shit's getting real, boys. So Nick left her job teaching uh, English in July. She vaguely planned to join or create an alternative cabaret band in hopes of gaining enough performing credits for an equity card. <laughs> like, who the, a cabaret band? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> to this end, she wanted to write sketches and dialogue in preparation. Ken, he's a swell chap, so he jacked an extra BBC, and I made this joke in the original podcast. No, Sean, not Big Black Hawk. <laughs> oh. 
So he jacked an extra BBC microcomputer from his job at Hard Warden School, which contained the word processing chip Edward, so she could chip away with her writing skills. Providing you remember to get a floppy disk to store your work, the word processor is a very simple tool to use. I explained to Nick all you need to do was type D, then press return, then Edward, another return, and the word processor was then ready to use with a simple menu of choices before you. And if anybody's ever used DOS, it's not a simple menu. There's a lot of fucking typing, a lot of fucking confusion. Yeah, just use it, an iPad. Yeah. I mean, I know this is, I know I this mean, is 1984, but come on yeah. now. I hated it, man. I used to want to play Doom on my parents' computer back when, you know, there was like Windows 94. Yeah. And half the time, I'd have to ho- holler at my brother to have him log in the Doom for me. S- semicolon, backslash, command, exe, and all that yeah. other bullshit. Back in the back yeah. in the day, I went to a garage sale. And we got a uh, an old computer, and it came with a bunch of floppy disks, like the old big floppy disks. And it had like just a bunch of different software in there. And I was my dad had no idea about it and like what to do with it. So I went in there and like I figured out how to run programs myself of like doing that, like pressing D, pressing return, and then like backslash run, backslash whatever the disk said it was on the Boring. disk. And I figured all that out by myself. It was really impressive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, a few months later, everyone in the house decides to spend a Sunday afternoon at good old Dave's house down the street. Later that evening, when they get home, the computer was on with a message on the screen reading BBC B32K, Acorn DFS, so, Ken finds a file name, K-D-N. Now, Nick's files were all saved with like one letter, so D, O, B, etc. So, who in the hell saved this file while they were out? And the file read, Ken, Deb, Nick, true are the nightmares of a person. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn pretty flowers, turn towards the sun. For you shall grow old and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Get out your bricks. Pussycat, pussycat went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. So, like, so they found like an early David Bowie. So So what the fuck's going on, right? Like, why is David Bowie getting on this computer and leaving him like, you know, weird lyrics and, you know, everyone's. Don't worry about it, baby. Yeah, everyone's just freaked out at this point. (laughs) So we fast forward, and it's a few days before Christmas, and the odd stacking of objects in the kitchen starts up again. And on one occasion, chalk marks were seen on the brick corners of the support beams in the kitchen. We fast forward a little bit more to February, and after another Sunday outing, they find another surprise entry on the computer. This time, the file named was re And first off, it was written like Old English or Gaelic, and I'm not going to attempt to try it. And, and, you know, I don't want to punish Sean. So we've translated it, but he's going to give us his amazing Cogni accent. <laughs> like you had me try to read that one. It was like, oh, I bet a little bit of you and me, and I seen the monster myself. <laughs> I write on behalf of many. What strange words you speak, although I must confess I too have been badly educated. Sometimes it seems changes are somewhat obstructive, for many a time they would disturb me sleeping in my bed. You are a worthy man who has a fancy for woman, and you live in my house. I have no wish to alarm you, for it's only since the half-witted fool ripped apart my confines have I been tormented at night. I have seen many changes. Lastly, the schoolhouse in your home is a fitting place with lights which the devil makes and costly things which which my only friend Edmund Gray can afford or the king himself. It was a great crime to have stolen my house. Signed, L.W. All the time I was wondering, though, why was the file called re But then it came to me. Someone wanting to create a file would press C, and then the computer would then offer up a clean file. Then the rest of the letters would often form 
would then form a file name R-E-A-T. So at this point, uh, he's showing the poem and letter to anyone and everyone, anyone who can help him possibly translate the strange use of words. And they're like, get the fuck away from me, dude. Yeah, like, pussycat, <laughs> pussycat, what the fuck is this shit, right? So oh, Fright- oh, wait a minute. Is that the new Bowie single? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frightened and confused, uh, Ken brought this message to his col- colleague, Peter Trent- Trinder, a teacher of medieval literature who, according to the book, was convinced that it was written in Old English. The group inter- interpreted... Wait, like the, like the stomach tattoos? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> the, the group interpreted the mention of devil lights to mean the computer as described by someone with no concept of uh, communication or technology. So basically boomers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. 15, 15th century boomers. <laughs> devil lights. <laughs> Them computers, they're devil lights. Boomers. <laughs> Foosball's the devil. <laughs> I like Vicky Valacourt, and she likes me back. Anyways, a few days later, uh, his longtime friend, John Cummins, comes over. He lights up his pipe, and they come up with the following reply. In the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, dear LW, thank you for your message. We are sorry for disturbing you. What would you like us to do? Did you live in a house on this land in about 1620? Do you want to tell us, uh, do you want us to tell you more about our time? Why write a poem? Who is Edward Gray? Is he related to the Edgerton family? Do you have a family? Is the King James or Charles Stuart? What is the charge of your house? Was this village called Doddleston in your life, and how many families lived here? Thank you very much for your message. Thank you for not making us afraid. Ken, Debbie, and John. I'm going to go out on a limb here. That's a lot of fucking questions. Just say, hi, a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. You're like, hey, type us a novel. No That'd be great. <laughs> what the? Yeah, can you imagine, you know, having your grandpa sit there on a computer and try to answer <laughs> yeah. all those questions? Who is Pussycat? <laughs> you might get a reply back in two years. God. Now, the odd thing is they never get a reply while they are in the house, so only when they are gone. So after several days of hanging out and waiting, nothing, so they're like, fuck it, let's leave. They make a day trip to uh, London, and upon their return, the computer had the following message. It was an honest farm of oak and stone. It is helpful that you should tell me about thy time dost thou hath horse. Why is this dude being all like regular speak and then throwing in this old English yeah. crap? I don't he know. got a stomach tattoo. Yeah, like <laughs> David fucking Bowie, man. Come on, <laughs> ja- it says Joust Life on it. Uh, where was I? Edmund Gray, brother of John Gray, lives at Kenderton Hall. Thy king, of course, is Henry the Eighth, who was six and forty. I know not of King James. Mine charge house is a place of law, LW 28, March 1521. Now, King Henry is one of my favorite kings. He was the only one I found interesting. I knew something of him, and it came clearly to my mind that Henry VIII was not even close to being 46 by 1521. He had only been on the throne for 12 years and was still a young man. This was beginning to stink with fraud. Or is it part of the trickster phenomenon, right? Because we got all this poltergeist shit going on. So is somebody just kind of fucking with them, you know? Anyways, Hmm. the following communication took place on February the 16th. My goodly friend, I must needs say how it is that there are many things of which I have no knowledge. It seems to me that if you cannot say why you are in my house, then I can no more help you than if my wits had gone. I have no kinfolk I can tell you about. My wife has been taken with pestilence, and the Lord did take her soul and her unborn child. My farm is humble, but it is a pretty parcel of land, and has redstone footings and clean rushes on the beaten floor. This season I have much to do. I have to sow me barley early for the ale. It is that this is my craft, which I am best at, I fancy. 
Also, I have to go to Nortwich for my friend Richard Wishills, whose farm is so great as to allow him a four-year rotation to follow. I do so envy him. He has much there, but nothing that delights me more than his cheese. That shit's legendary, son. It cannot be equaled by any other for pleasantness or taste and wholesomeness of digestion. I shall need to go to the Chester this season and get me shoes. My goodly friend Thomas Adelsay, a tailor by craft, makes them sometimes. I also make shoes, but none of my swine are ready. It is far too costly unless I kill one. Do you know the country of Chester? The Watergate is a place that brings many traders. It's a shame the port does shrink. I can remember great ships now. They get smaller by each tide. But Chester Port is still greater than uh, Liverpool. I am off into the east wall of Chester, Cow Lane. It is not so tiresome there by the cross that is where my fowl or swine do not trip up my poor body. I hear tell that one of you are teacher in Hardwitten. Do you mean Hordline? Do you still earn a great sum of twenty pounds per year? I remember my unpleasant dean, Henry Mann, who is likened to a fish. If any boy <laughs> shall appear naturally averse to learning after a fair trial, he shall be expelled elsewhere. Lest like a drone, he should devour the bee's honey. Nay, I cannot make merry on holy day for fear my life, my friend, was once a fluting on a holy day, and did have his ears pinned to the wood block. I think when you say Doddleston, you mean Doodleston. My queen, of course, is Catherine Pott. This was the work of an intelligent man. His first name appeared in this message as Lucas. Welcome to the puzzle. It seemed from the third line that we were in his home. He was quite indignant that we were here actually asking him to identify what items he possessed. It would have been obvious, but it wasn't. It was all quite confusing. So Monday, February 18th, Ken lost a copy of what he wrote to Lucas, but like clockwork, while they were away, he came home to an e-word file named Ken1. My good friend, can you tell me for what reason are you asking me many questions, which I cannot understand? I'm confused. The writing machine, which is a wonderful thing, somewhat unnatural. I fancy unknown to myself it may be, but I've seen you make lights on your box and I am cunning. Yes, I know of Bristol, my kinfolk did come here from Bridgewater and Taunton, by the river tone until they died. To make merry, I like to be at the ale. Yes, sometimes I use that bridge at Alford. Your merry-making pleases me, but it is rather noisy at times. Well, you tell your woman to play more that flute thing. It is a pleasant sound, I think, when she plays. How do you travel to your school in Hardwitten? I must hurry, as my dogs are loose and being troublesome to my fowl, Lucas Wainham. Okay. <laughs> so at this point, we're going to fast forward this tale by a lot. And I mean, a lot. And if it isn't clear at this point in the book, basically, it's just a bunch of back and forth. They write a message, they leave, and then this cogni ghost comes and leaves them a message to read and then, you know, for when they return to the house. And originally, I typed out like, one, two, three, 24 fucking messages that he left them. And Sean can't keep up that Cogni accent all night long. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the future. Yeah. <laughs> so skipping ahead, around April 14th that year, Ken and Deb came home and found the computer screen blinking. A friend of Lucas had sent them a message. It turns out that Lucas had been arrested and is being held by the local sheriff, Sir Thomas Fowlhurst. Due to his communication with the light box, or Leem's Boist, as Lucas had called it. The friend also reveals that Lucas is a pseudonym. Lucas is then released and held under house arrest. 
reassuming communication and confessing how scared he is of the faith that could await him. He also reveals that the lean Boist was brought to his house by someone called One from the year 2109. Lucas had been under the impression that Webster was also from the year 2109 until the latter said that he was living in 1985. So why did he get arrested? Because he was talking yeah. to a devil box. Like everybody in the town was like, hey, what's that? You got this on. And it was like, you know, the light box. And they're like, oh, you're communicating with the devil. Yeah. Devil box communicating is like a level three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> level three. They burst at the stake for that, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Make sure he uses the three seashells. <laughs> oh, shit. I looked at this new communication with an open mouth. Deb and I had to sit down and look at it over and over. He had thought we were now from the year 2109, but we had written our date to him in February, and we had repeated it only days ago. Was he suddenly aware that we were getting messages from not one but two futures? Who else had he been talking to on the leams? I stepped into the confusion with a message of my own. 2109? In case it was all part of a hoax, I used what I thought was a very tongue-in-cheek greeting. It was a bit Star Trek. Calling 2109, and with that, the message was sent. So an unnamed contact from 2109 then starts leaving impenetrable messages on the BBC, saying that the events they are experiencing have a wider purpose. Ken, Deb, Peter... We are sorry that we can give you only two choices. One, you either have your predicament explained in such a non-rhyme way that you have instant understanding of the cause you should not have to happen. Or, two, try to understand that you have a purpose that shall, in your lifetime, changes the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect your thoughts directly, but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. All we can say is that we are all part of the same God whatever he or it is. In the meantime, Webster and his friends try to think of a way to save Lucas's life. Cause you know, he's been arrested. They're about to put him on trial. They remember a chance reference by Lucas to Henry Mann, Dean of Chester and find information in the present that Mann had in 1953 communicated with Elizabeth Barton, the so-called maid of Kent. Barton was a Catholic nun who had made prophecies critical to Henry VIII's marriages to Anne Boyle and who, <laughs> and who was executed as a result Boykin. in 1534. So Webster gives this information to Lucas to use as a bargaining chip with the sheriff. Hell, it doesn't work. Go fucking figure. That's like the lamest thing that you can do. And Luke, Lucas <laughs> goes on trial regardless. But he's kept alive to keep the light box working because the sheriff and everybody else is, even though it's like devil work they're you know, they're fascinated with it during this period. Thomas Fowlhurst begins to use the box to communicate with Webster. And it emerges that these events are happening in the year 1546 communication is later reestablished with Lucas, but with further intervention and inscrutable comments from 2109. Webster and Lucas begin to suspect that 2109 is changing their messages and develop a system where Lucas starts communicating with paper and charcoal left out for him in the present. Somehow Lucas is meanwhile able to see and hear Webster in the past. It's not really explained. I don't know. Through this means, Lucas reveals that his name is Thomas Harden or Harwarden, a graduate of Baranus who had been dean of the chapel there but was expelled in 1538 for refusing to expunge the name of the pope from a book in the chapel, as was required by law after the break with Rome. 2109 became extremely irritated that Webster had learnt uh, Wayman's real name and demanded that he stops dis disrupting their experiments. At this point, it becomes clear to everyone in the story that 2109 had been changing the files that were being sent back and forth, all the historical inaccuracies, false names, bad spellings, not putting commas in the right fucking place, you know, capitalizing words that were weird, that were all part of the experiment from 2109, but it was never fully understood by the author or other people from the story why this was going on. Eventually, the... Grosner family, Hardin's landlords, demand that he leaves his house. Hardin leaves a final message 
wishing Webster and his friends well and stating that he will go to Bristol to buy a horse, then see if he is welcome again in Bar Noose. He says that he will write a book about the events and hopes that someday they might meet so he can read Webster's book and Webster his. Hardin is never heard from again, although Webster finds a reference to him, or at least someone with that name, becoming vicar at Little Barrington and Glasher Stire from 1551 to 1554. And the tale is rounded off with some final ever cryptic communication from 2109. So, Steve, bring it on home, baby. Ken, Deb, Peter, true are the nightmares of those that fear. What you fear will be your reality if you let it believe in yourselves. Bowie, <laughs> safe, safe are the bodies of the silent world. As long as your kind cannot penetrate our world, we are safe. Turn, pretty flower. Turn. <laughs> <clears throat> turn, pretty flower. Turn towards the sun. For you shall grow and sow, but the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Knowledge will be your progress. But your kind are coming close to getting their fingers burnt. Indirectly, you may prevent this. Get out your bricks. Get ready to build. <laughs> pussycat, pussycat, went to the London to seek fame and fortune. The cat went to visit the queen, but instead frightened a little mouse. And under the chair, ultimately, London will be a significant place. Stick to your main aims. It doesn't matter how hard they seem to get. Do not be distracted by that tiny mouse that has a de deceiving charm. Faith must not be lost. You all rely on each other's faith. There is another person to come. They will be the help we needed. You will know when they come. Thomas did eventually write his book and soon died. Shortly after, he placed it in a secure place. It shouldn't take too many years to find it. Though he wrote it in Latin with the help of a friend they met in Oxford. We will finish now. You have a lot of work to do. There is no need to write back as we have as we will have gone. Thank you for your cooperation. 2109. And that's how the story ends. Like the biggest cliffhanger is that this <laughs> this guy, this this like cogni accent douchebag writes his book but writes it in Latin. Like you don't fucking speak Latin, so why would you write the book in like another language? And you know, they said that it would be found in you know, fairly soon. And this book was written in 1984, and the events took place from 84 to 85. So that's like 35, 36 years ago, and nobody's heard shit about this time-traveling book written in the 15th century. So now, all those inaccuracies aside, the thing like 84, 85, when all this poltergeist wow. activity um, took place, they actually contacted one of the uh, the top paranormal teams in Britain at the time. And um, they came out and, you know, they made sure that after Deb or Ken wrote a letter and they left the house, um, they put up like scanners and stuff like little trip lights. Um, they made sure the house was locked and they were watching the house the whole entire time. They checked to make sure that nobody was in the house before they did all this. And then when Deb and Ken would come back, they would all go in together and the par paranormal team actually verified that, yes, something strange was going on because nobody was in the house. And here was this weird file blinking on the computer. So that part of the story is still unexplained. And, you know, it's like, dude, what the fuck is going on here in like 2109? What the fuck is like all this David Bowie cryptic pussycat shit? Yeah, it's basically the most fucked up mm -hmm. pen pal story ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of like yeah. the original ghost in the machine, right? Because we're led to believe that it could just be like a ghost of a an, a, an Englishman from the learns how to yeah. learns how to type on a computer. computer. No big deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, the other thing I, I thought about was the six toe prints that are on the wall. I forgot all and, about that. <laughs> um, there, I, I can't remember mm -hmm. what cryptid we covered it early on in the show, but it's it called like the, the dope. The, the Dover Demon, <laughs> oh, which that. looked very much like a gray <laughs> oh, alien, yeah. but it had these weird six-toe, you know, like footprints um, that it left in the mud. And we always talk about how gray aliens might be us from the future. Mm. So the idea that this 2109 is contacting us, the one is contacting us from this year, 
and they're doing this experiment in time, maybe that's what this is. This was like some gray alien. Maybe, you know, he listened to David Bowie music in the future. And they're just, this is like the beginnings of the experiment. Like they're just trying to see if they can manipulate time and have like a three way communication, like a time traveling sexy sandwich. And now that they got it to work, like they're moving on to the next experiment. Weird. Yeah. Well, that's and my before, before their computer started getting messed with, wasn't there a lot of like poltergeist activity going on as well? Yeah. They like, would come home and there'd be like weird, like they'd have like, you know, the tins of cat food stack in a pyramidal shape or they'd have like weird, right. sta- weird stacking that, you know, you roll a toilet paper would be in the middle of two, two liters of Coke and they would have all this heavy shit on top. And it's like, dude, how the fuck is that even possible? Mm hmm. Well, they they said they heard toilet toilets flushing and knocking on the walls, and they could smell weird smells, all sorts of weird shit. Yeah. Wild, man. Huh. Yeah. So I hope this time around we did it, you know, a better justice than the, the first stab <laughs> that I took at Right, it. right. And I hope I didn't wear out your Cogni accent. Well, hell yeah, man. I think it'd be fun to maybe uh, revisit a couple old stories from the past. Yeah. You know, back when we uh, didn't really research shit, we just kind of came up with stuff right before we recorded that we had, you know, read about or heard about years ago. And episode 23 was when uh, Mixmaster Sean was giving away uh, recipes for his uh, melatonin tea. Like, uh, he was just. <laughs> we were, I remember that shit. Oh, we were like God, ripping you yeah. hard about that. And you were like, no, sleepy no, time guys, tea like, and melatonin. This is what you yeah. do. You take like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You mix it together, put a shot of whiskey in there and ha ha ha. You'll be astral projecting all night long. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Speaking of uh, speaking of astral projecting and stuff like that, um, on the latest episode of Joe Rogan's podcast, he had Post mm-hmm. Malone on there, and they talk about doing psychedelics in a float trip or a float tank. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, yeah. No dog, not for me. <laughs> Fuck that. It's pretty interesting <laughs> to hear the stuff that they see, though. And um, their experiences and stuff is pretty interesting. Yeah, I, maybe one day if it becomes. Good. I, don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> I I think that like you're already vulnerable enough in that situation with the float tanks. The stuff you told me about, yeah, mix that into it. I don't know. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think if people can handle it, cool. But like, I just, I, don't, I. Uh, you should just float. I'm, all right, just go and float. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to try that. My thing is is that I'm such a cheap ass and I don't want to spend money on something that I am skeptical is going to work. Cuz you know what I mean? Like you have to go in there completely like you guys have talked about it. like go in there not expecting anything, zen out, chill out mm-hmm. and you guys know me when the fuck am I ever chill? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I might uh, you know, come March that special time of the year for me, I might book us all a float trip as a, mm. you know, a nice little bromance present to the two. Just of balls you. out in the same tank. Oh, no, good. There's only one thing. Thank God. I know. He's that thing, God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be swimming around your guys' ass water. God, wouldn't that be like a weird three-way time travel sandwich, right there? Sean here, gross, will not get in a fucking, <laughs> fucking God. hot tub at a hotel ever. He's definitely not going to get in a fucking float tank with me and Preston's greasy ass. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, we should. We should all three do a float um, uh, come March. You know what? Come March, Preston, that special time of year, I, we'll, we'll get ourselves each one and we'll go halvesies on Steven. Okay. And then for the show, we could uh, each report what happened. And then we can go down to the paranormal experience and uh, have yeah, ourselves a little, a burrito? little Bigfoot burrito. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to try a place out. That got a lot of that got a lot of traction on the post, man. When you yeah. you and Jeffrey posted that, yeah, hell yeah, I was man. like, what? Yeah, shout out to Paranormal Egg Experience if they're listening. True that. <laughs> cool. Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and plug some stuff and get out of here then. Cool. Steve, what do you got, man? You can check out our Facebook page, Pixelated Paranormal Podcast. Get on there, share the posts. It helps us out greatly. It shows us how many people we're reaching. We're usually at a steady 150 to 200 people per post. So that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. For people seeing our stuff. Uh, the more shares we get, the more exposure we get. So check us out on that. Also get on Instagram at PXL Paranormal. 
And that's where we post all the little pictures and uh, visual aids, random stuff throughout throughout the times. It's all a good time. We're yeah. always you can send us a message on there. We'll answer in a timely fashion, and all that. Yeah, it's fun. Shout out to um, a a listener that just purchased himself a new computer. Oh. And with the intention of he's wanting to step out of his comfort zone and possibly join us for an episode or two. So, um, yeah, shout out to that listener. I don't know if he wants me to say his name, but might be having a little guest on sometime. We should do yeah. more guest guest episodes. If yeah, I think we will, scheduling man. Uh, timing allows. Joe, who gave us a story of his mom... Uh, his mom and their harrowing adventure with uh Val Kilmer's cousin. Val Kilmer's cousin. <laughs> um yeah. I want to have him on the show here sometime soon. And then also uh our good buddy Isaac. I'd yeah. like to get him on here as well. So we'll start doing that. And guys, please, if you have a story to share with us, send us emails, send us PMs, DMs. But also nope, that's my PayPal app. Hang on a second. <laughs> I was like, are you really gonna Hit your PayPal also, right please, now? Shoot is that me where a we're at? Dollars. I want to buy a new record player. No, um, hang on. Yeah, I forget no where I put that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, if you guys have a story to tell us, send us an email or call our Google phone number. We've got a Google voice number. It's 913 662 3144. Leave us a voicemail. I think you can leave up to a three-minute voicemail. So if you want to leave a longer message, just uh, you know, hang up and call us right back, and I can edit together your message, no problem. But yeah, we'd love to hear your story being told by you. But if not, shoot us an email, shoot us a message, a text, whatever. It'd be awesome to hear from you and share your stories. Cool. And then check out the rest of the shows on the Pixelated Sausage Network. Check out Pixelated Sausage. Check out Attack the Backlog. Check out An Amazingly Baka. And then please get ready because we're bringing back 13 Nightmares. We'll have a new episode dropping here. Probably, uh, God, everything goes to plan by this Friday. If not, you can catch <laughs> we'll it. Keep saying it every week. episode. And then are you going to do a Cogni accent the whole entire time? Nope, Preston, I won't ever do that again, probably. <laughs> Maybe with a little practice, but uh, it sounded like a great idea, and it quickly proved that it was not a good idea. The next so. story I find, like, I don't even care if uh, that, uh, what was that book that I bought in Colorado, like, uh, he, uh, Emotep, like, I'm going to just make you do a Cogni accent that whole entire, whole entire time. I don't even care if it. Also, check out the Patreon on pixelatedsausage.com. Yeah. Um, right now, there he has some reward stuff set up for that. Um, but, you know, uh, even if you just donate a dollar, a dollar a month, or just a one-time donation, it's cool. It helps helps offset the cost of um, server fees, you know, hosting, shit like that. And it Mark does a lot. Alive. Yeah. He does a lot of stuff in the background. So, um, it's, it's good to mention that. And yeah, it would definitely. greatly support that and support the podcast as well. So oh, yeah. none of that money hey, goes guys, to uh, us. It's all towards all towards the, the, the all towards the network. And he always yeah. all the money he receives from Patreon, it goes right into usually the hosting fees. Yeah, for sure. Or or content. So. Yeah, content. Yeah. And also uh, T shirts are on the way. COVID has kind of slowed down progress a little bit, but we've got some new shirts and some other merch coming at you. Uh, here before too long. I'm just trying to get the last little details sealed on that. We can get that going and figure out, you know, how we're going to rock and roll with that. So, cool. Preston, what do you got for us? And as always, if you need a beard, if you want a beard, if you want to grow a beard that's guaranteed to land you in a three way time travel sandwich, check out bigdobsbeardbomb.com and use promo code PXLPARA for 20% off of your order. And use that code to get yourself scents like Dundee Cedar, Bay Rum, Sweet Tobacco, Citrus, Fresh, Mint, and Classic. And if you live in the Wichita area and you need to get your hair fixed up, go check out www.cutsbycolin.com and book yourself an appointment today with our good buddy Colin and ask for the Razzle Dazzle. And maybe you got some crap out of alignment and you need some needlework done, a little acupuncture. Go over to threepillarshealth.com and book your appointment with Benny today.
Hell yeah. And in Wichita, please check out our friends down at Fast Print at Harry and Rock. And also go down and say hi to Leslie and the gang down at CD Trade Post on Pawnee and Seneca. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go get horizontal after this vertical plane and go to bed. So with that, I'd like (laughs) to say cheers to the weird shit in the world and to those of us that love to talk about it. And stay spooky and stay on the paranormal highway. The cast that Pixelated Paranormal would like to thank you for listening to this week's episode. Pixelated Paranormal is here to tell you tales of the fantastical, the strange, the unknown. Tales that will move you a little further down the paranormal highway. If you'd like to share your own listener story, we would love to hear it. Email us at pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. Again, that's pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Again, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange.